The two Shell Helix cars rolling up. This has been their best for the year. Now keep in mind, these are the finishing positions of race two. It's Bow and Johnson off the uh, first row. Row two is Murphy and Ingle. Row three is Larry Perkins and Tony Longhurst. Row four, John Faulkner and Peter Brock. We move our way back, row five, it's Trevor Ashby, Terry Finnegan. Two good results there from the second race for the Privateers. John Trimble will be happy with that, and Kevin Heffernan. Row seven is uh, Karen Brewer and Glenn Seaton, who's not there. Darren Hossack and Stephen Richards. Karen Brewer, that's an improved position there, and Alan Jones has made a tyre change. He's gone outside his elected six, and the ruling there is you must start rear of grid. Now, keep in mind that Glenn Seaton is not here. He is missing from this third and final race, so too much damage sustained in that second race. We're getting ready for a start. Green light, away we go. Let's see who gets the jump. Have a look at Ingle oh, on the Ingle. inside. Oh, oh what Ingle. about Murphy on the dirt? It's all happened from the start there. Ingle got away to a great jump. We go on board with Dick Johnson here. There's Murphy on the inside. They had a bit of a tangle as well. Murphy's got the inside run. Oh, no. oh, to look at Greg oh, Murphy. Look across that all gone off into the kitty litter. Goodness me, the most dramatic opening half a lap. Cars going everywhere. We'll try and recap what happened there. You could see Murphy looking across when he got the tap off the, the line. He was furious, and then it continued all the way down to the carousel. Well, there's some pretty serious muscling going on there. Unbelievable stuff going into the first corner, even before the kick. So it's Russell Ingle who leads the way. Then we go back to John Bow. There's Murphy a little further back. Faulkner's up there. So too is Ashby. Russell Engel really got the hammer down off that second row. Brilliant start from the Castrol. Number eight, and look at this, a big attack on the outside. We take Shell Helix, replay. Dick Johnson right alongside Greg Murphy there as they head down toward the carousel. This is under brakes going into the carousel. Watch there. Just about coming into contact there as they run very, very wide. Here it is from another angle. Keep your eyes on Murphy and Johnson. There it is there. Diving up the inside was Longhurst. Murphy's gone right off the circuit. So too Johnson. That allowed Brock through, Faulkner through, the whole field through, and Stevie Richards is into the uh, gravel as well. Well, you can see a big attack from John Bow just before we cut to that replay, and he hasn't been able to find his way past Ingle. We're looking at the back of Russell Ingle's Commodore. John Bow and the Shell 18 Ford climbing all over the back of the Castrol Commodore with Tony Longhurst. A great start from him in third position. John Bow, race two. That was his first race win here at Lakeside since 1995. He was very happy about that. He'd like to do it again. He's going for the round win. Murphy is in the pits. So it is all over. The day's finished early for Greg Murphy, and he would be furious. Just the story of his, his championship, isn't it, Lee? He's had so much rotten luck, it just seems to haunt him race after race after race. He pulls out of another one. Look at Russell Ingle under plenty of fire from the Shell 18 Ford. John Bow, he wants to win this thing. Tony Longhurst locked in behind the Shell Ford, then Peter Brock on 0-5, his farewell drive at Lakeside, up in fourth position, the first of the HRT cars, well, the only remaining HRT car. Barry, Tony Longhurst said to me yesterday, he said, this car is set up good enough to win here. He said, I've made the right tyre selection, Yokohama have given me some good ones, and he's now running up in third. Well, he's not wrong, is he? You know, he's equally as competitive as this lot. It's interesting that uh, the fr front three runners are all on Dunlop, so there's not going to be any tyre advantage there. There's Russell Ingalls, Windscreens O'Brien profile, his career profile, and so far this year, see he had a, a really good win at Winton, and also Phillip Island. This is the view, the Dunlop view from the back of Ingalls' car, as Longhurst looks for a way past as well. This is really tight. Have a look at John Bow, come up now. Really putting the pressure on Ingalls. Through they come. Out of the carousel section, getting ready to come around underneath the Dunlop Bridge. Well, joining us in commentary now, Ford Credit Racing driver and championship points leader, Glenn Seaton. Glenn, what happened in that last round? Uh, well, really, last race? Lee, really, Lee, I come up out of Hungry Corner, which is just where um, Russell Engel and John Bow just come up out of there, and just, just got to the top of the hill here, and uh, just uh, had my foot caught underneath the brake pedal and just couldn't get it out. And uh, once, by the time you actually got it out and put your foot on it, uh, it was too late, the car ran wide and straight off into the, the tyres there. And obviously too much damage uh, sustained to come in this one. It is really, it's bent the uh, left-hand rail a bit and also the floor, but uh, we'll be back. Um, we've still uh, quite a, got a, a little bit of a points lead at the moment and there's still three rounds of the championship to go, so anything can happen, but uh, what a sensational race this is here. I have to say, Glenn, that is a very admirable admission. I mean, you could have said I went for the brakes, I were a bit spongy, went straight on, but uh, I've got to hand it to you. you know, it just shows that uh, even Glenn Seaton is human after all.
Well, yeah, we, we all make mistakes, and uh, it's just one of those things. But uh, naturally, I'm going to be like a terrier dog for the rest of the series. I'm going to come back like uh, gum busters. <laughs> I think for you know for for me and for people who sit at home, think, well, wow, how how can that happen? You know, your foot slips off the throttle, gets jammed on the brake. It's something that can happen, isn't it? Well, it's amazing, Barry, because uh, you don't realise how much you're on the edge until <laughs> something like that happens, and. Uh, Really, you're driving these cars right to the limit everywhere. Like just, just for yesterday's qualifying to be nine cars and a half a second difference between first and ninth, just one flick of the switch, yeah, it's incredible. and uh, you, it's all over. Like it's just amazing. So uh, these things do happen, like I say. But uh, we'll be back. Um, we'll be back for uh, Western Australia, and, and one that I'm looking forward to because uh, we've had great results here. Well, Glenn, we've just been doing a bit of fiddling with the points, and it appears as though you can't lose your championship lead today. So how does that make you feel? Well, probably one way it makes me feel good. Another way, it's probably uh, a little bit disappointing. But. Uh, no, uh, the car's been very competitive everywhere we've gone, and uh, there's really no reason between now and the end of the championship uh, why we're not going to be competitive. Uh, Warren Park is the final round, uh, which will probably go down to the wire and after today's event, and uh, that'll be great, and that has been a, a great hunting ground for me in the past. And the two guys who are a threat to your championship are running first and second in this one. You probably didn't want to see that. Well, I like the competition, to tell you the truth, and uh, it's great to see the championship go down to the wire. That's that's what we're all here for. We're here for entertainment, and uh, this will be an entertainment package right to the end. Great sporting comment, I have to say. <laughs> really. Well, we get back to it, and Russell Ingalls still leads away from John Bell. Longhurst remains in third. He is going really well. Peter Brock in fourth, Larry Perkins back in fifth, and Faulkner is up to sixth. We're working their way around. This one remains to be a close one. Well, Glenn Seaton, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for your time, mate. And we look forward to seeing you at, at uh, Barbagallo. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be there with all guns blazing. And <laughs> getting your own back. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Here is the Tony Longhurst windscreens O'Brien profile. His history and then this year so far, fifth at Sandown, ninth. It's been a mixed year for Tony Longhurst. This one in front of his home crowd has been the best by far. And he's sitting here and he's looking for his first podium finish for the 97 season. Well, it couldn't have happened in a better place when you think about it, exactly as you say, in front of his home crowd. And uh, you've got to say that Longhurst is a really good, fast driver. You know, he just hasn't uh, had the luck to get everything together. And uh, by now, the package, you've got to say, his thing is well on the boil, isn't it? It's uh, lapping just a fraction slower than um, England, uh, John Bell. This would be very encouraging for the Yokohama teams as well because Tony has been struggling with tyres throughout the year trying to get the, the package the way he wants it and the tyre product that he wants. But if these Yokohamas are proving this consistent this late in the day, that's a good sign for the future. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, it's... Uh, oh, Murph. Poor yeah. old Murph. Murphy's law. Well, in that one shot that encapsulates his 1997 yeah, season, it's yeah, been an right. absolute shocker. Mark, just getting back to uh, Longhurst, you're talking about the tyre durability and he's coming good at the uh, the end of the season. That looks good for the Australian 1000 Classic on October 18-19. Yeah, people in the know say that he will have a very strong package up at Mount Panorama as he had there last year, so expect some fireworks from the Castrol Ford in the Australian 1000 Classic on October 19. The Enforcer leads the way and he's been involved in some pretty hot and sticky situations this year so far, but I tell you what, there's still plenty of supporters for Russell Ingle here at Lakeside today, plenty of people hanging over the fence and waving their arms and saying, go Russell, go. John Bow is making him work for it though. Still sitting nicely in second spot. Back to Longhurst. Then we pick up Brock, who's doing well in fourth. Perkins, Faulkner, Jones, Johnson, Ashby and Finnegan. They're your top ten. This is the shot. The Dunlop in-car camera on the back of Russell Ingalls car. John Bow just looking for a way through. It's just a shame that uh, Tony Longhurst can't make up that little bit of ground on John Bow because I feel that if Tony could get up the backside of uh, John Bow, that would really push John into making absolutely every finding holes with her arm holes to get past uh, Russell Ingle. Well, I'll make a, uh, a bit of a guess here. If, if Bow remains there, he should still oh, take it. Oh, oh yes! Well, talk about applying, applying pressure. You can't get any closer than that without touching John Bow. Letting Russell Ingle know he's dead serious about winning this race. You can't get closer than that. Ingle looking at the back of the Castrol Commodore as he leads him down under the Dunlop Bridge. 225 kilometres an hour, breaking hard for Hungry Corner. Tremendous battle this. And if one makes the slightest mistake, Guy Bahai will be taking advantage. Oh, Mike Conway. Off on the door there. Yeah, Mike Conway in trouble back there. He's had a bit of a spin, the privateer, but not in the way of this leading bunch. Last year here at Lakeside, John Bow finished third overall for the day behind Alan Jones and Craig Lowndes. 
who got the clean sweep. He uh, could go from third to first today. We go back. Perkins is sitting back there behind Brock. There's John Faulkner. He's doing well. He's got himself up ahead of Dick Johnson. So Faulkner running in sixth position in the better electrical car, the top privateer. There is uh, Dick Johnson. Back in seventh position. Jones has worked his way up into eighth from rear of grid. That's a credible effort from Alan Jones. Ashby and Finnegan, they round out your top ten. Well, Alan's had a few problems with tyres today, running on the Bridgestone rubber, and just can't quite get the setup right on the car so it doesn't burn up the tyres. Shell Helix on board camera with Dick Johnson as he continues his charge through the field after getting caught up in that first corner accident with Greg Murphy. The shot that I like, Mark, is when you go through this right-hander into the fast left-hand kink if we stay with this and just watch. Oh, it's, we've got a lot of sun in the face now. It's, uh, just watch for oh he's not gonna have a go here is he? you see that <laughs> that is uh, when you realize how quick that is and how much the car moves it's uh, quite oh, oh hello. right up alongside hello hello knocking hello. on the door I dick threw. johnson <laughs> little tap to let him know he's there and then a nice clean run through the inside faulkner had no answer for that johnson absolutely steamrolled his way through on the inside and he's really on fire at lakeside today oh, dick johnson letting john faulkner know that he's got more equity in this track than what john faulkner has he's done a, a, uh, a lot of laps around the lakeside circuit as dick johnson so he moves up here is the john faulkner windscreens o'brien profile first in round six of the shell privateers cup in 96 nascar rookie of the year in 94 He's got some uh, impressive results there. And here's how he's been going this year. You can see there, four top ten results at Sandown, Simmons, Winton and Eastern Creek. This has been his best year. It's only his second year in the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. He's been driving for a long time, though. A lot of years in the various classes of touring cars. This is his second year in the Shell Australian Touring Car category in the V8 supercar format. Well, Dick Johnson will be really hungry to uh, keep that momentum going. He's got Larry Perkins ahead of him, and he has to finish fifth. If Ingle wins this race, Johnson has to finish fifth to take second on the day behind his teammate, and I know how much Dick would love to be on the podium this afternoon. Well, speaking of privateers, we go back to 10th place. This is Terry Finnegan, the view from the Sony Commodore. He didn't start race one. He had a bit of bad luck there, but he's been going all right in race two and he's sitting in the top ten in race three so terry finnegan's coming good towards the end of the season as well i'd probably say this would be his best year in the shell australian touring car championship there's terry hard at work i was just looking on the front windscreen you can see the heated front windscreen i think that is something that has uh, been so overdue in touring cars for many many years i wonder why they haven't done it see his lap speed there just under 240 kilometers an hour as he comes through the sweeper there, that is an incredible amount of speed. Simply how narrow the track is and the lack of runoff if you get it wrong. Finnegan really attacking the course. Up in the top ten, as Lee said, does a great job. The Sony Auto Sound Commodore, we saw him as top privateer at Eastern Creek three weeks ago. Recently switched over to Rob Benson engines. Benson supplying a lot of the privateers now in the V8 supercar category. And Terry getting a lot of speed out of the car. Currently just outside the top ten doing a great job well speaking of moving forward that's what the man in front of him is doing stevie richards he went off the track with greg murphy at the same time out into the gravel he's worked his way up into, into a ninth position in the valvoline cummins entry as we look at the mobile hrt car of peter brock and uh, larry perkins sitting in behind him larry gets it sideways out Whoa! of the carousel hang on to it larry <laughs> Getting all out of shape there. He's chasing Peter Brock hard. This is the battle. You see Peter Brock's car. Bit. He's still um, he's getting smoked from the inside uh, left tire. I don't know whether that's just because of the down on the pressure of the, of the body down on it, but he, he may have had some panel damage because you saw that coming off the left front. Well, as any Queenslanders watching this, it's a bit of history, folks. The last time you're going to see Peter Brock, the master, driving on the fast Brisbane Lakeside Raceway. What an unbelievable career this man has had. And winds down toward Bathurst. The Australian 1000 Classic on October 19. It's going to be one hell of a year. We move from Brisbane to Western Australia in a couple of weeks' time. And for all of our West Australia viewers, if you're interested in grandstand seating at Barbagello, you're best off calling the West Australian uh, Sporting Car Club in Subiaco for pre-booked seating, and that'll get you the best views of the circuit. So give them a call once again, the Western Australia Sporting Car Club in Subiaco, to arrange your grandstand seating. And uh, the pre-booked tickets are the way to go.
Peter Brock currently in fourth position. Here's our leading trio. Russell Engel still in command from John Bow. Hasn't been able to make a move on the Castrol driver. Headlights ablaze as he comes up towards slower traffic to make sure he's there. It gives the best indication that he's coming up behind. John Bow in second position. Tony Longhurst hasn't been able to get past the Shell 18 forward. And there's a bit of a gap back to the battle. Fourth, fifth and sixth position. That's Brock, Perkins and Johnson. Well, we've just had uh, confirmation from our statistician, Nigel Greenway, that if Bow sits here, he will still win this round. So he doesn't have to do anything uh, silly. Just maintain that second spot and he'll be right. He will win his first round ever at Lakeside. It's just typical of John's terrier-like persistence. He really just digs in for the battle and just squeezes results out of a situation you wouldn't expect him to. And that's what takes a champion driver. He's won championships in just about every category of motorsport, and he really wants a second title in 97. Ingle hasn't had a bad day either. He had a, that hiccup in the first race, that the confrontation with Mark Larkham. He lost his clutch in that first race, fought back, fought back in the second one, and now he's going to a very aggressive start, and he's led the whole way. We're heading for one heck of a championship finish, aren't we, guys? I mean, you think how uh, determined Bow and Russell Ingle are to close the gap to seat and take the fight right up. These final three rounds are going to be absolutely sensational. Well, that's great. You know, you have to really say thank you to Glenn Seaton. <laughs> I mean, he's really uh, put some life into the championship. And uh, as you say, you know, it's um, it's going to be interesting. But if you had to stick your money on anybody besides Seaton, you'd say Bow. You know, as you say, you know, he's been there and just sort of creeping up. He hasn't won, but, uh, you know, he's missed the consistency, isn't he? Well, at the end of the day, it will be interesting when we uh, take a look at those championship points to see just how close it will be between Glenn Seaton, Russell Engel and uh, John Bow. Don't discount Larry Fergins either because he got those points back from Sandown when he was excluded from the results of the second race. So he's not out of the picture either. Maybe a bit too far away for the championship, but for maybe for a podium finish in the championship. Longhurst is still running hot as well. Two laps to go, 238 kilometres an hour for John Bow and the Shell 18 Ford. And that's a good indication of how well the privateers are running. Terry Finnegan doing exactly the same speed through the sweep of that time around. Everything's starting to get a little bit tired now. The tyres have done three races virtually. Drivers may be getting a little weary. So they really have to battle through these final laps. John Bow just trying to close the gap to Russell Engel, but Engel maintaining that gap. 1.2 seconds the last time over the start finish line. He's done a 52-1, Bauer 52-2. Russell Engel has the fastest lap of the race so far, a 51.89, but no one's down in that territory now. The guys just working their way past John Trimble and his return drive to the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship in the bottle magic entry. Now, we've just been uh, given a piece of paper here. Positions remain as is. Seaton will lead the championship by eight points over Engel, who will then have a 14-point buffer over Bow. So it has really closed up considerably. We were talking this morning, Barry, about... 30s and 40s and 50s and now it's really closed up <laughs> yeah i was just looking there looking at longhurst i thought longhurst was uh, gonna try and have a go at jb i mean it's that would be a very very brave move it's last lap as we take dunlop on board camera russell engel he's only got, got a quarter of a lap left <laughs> he's pretty determined he's not going to lose this position he's a real fighter russell engel fought his way back from that clutch drama in the opening heat and he's coming up trumps here today. Ever since he's been named the enforcer, he's been in more drama than ever before. Down onto the main straight comes Russell Engel. The chequered flag comes out and he takes out race three here today at Lakeside. And look at that, yes. the clenched fist. He is very, very happy. He knew he needed that. And he is ecstatic. Good on you, Russell Engel. A good win there. In the third and final race here at Lakeside. John Bowen for second. Tony Longhurst, his first podium finish of the year. He'll be delighted with those efforts. And Peter Brock in his last drive. There he is, the king of the road. He finished in fourth position. Here are the final placings for you. The Shell Helix race score. Ingle Bow Longhurst, as we said, Brock. Larry Perkins hung in there for a top five finish. Yeah, Dick Johnson in six. John Faulkner. Alan Jones didn't have a great day for him uh, by his standards. Stephen Richards and Terry Finnegan.